When you turn something from boring to interesting and exciting on YouTube, you get views. Take the finance niche, for example. It's a dry topic, but it's exploded in popularity with lucrative CPMs. But all of that comes with a catch, insane competition. Enter Humphrey Yang. He is a rare breed in cracking both the long and short form content puzzles. And he has taken something as boring, as mundane, as personal finance, and made it, well, very interesting. And so I started making content on there. It blew up within the first like 30 days I had a hundred thousand followers and he's going to piece that jigsaw puzzle together for you right now from ideation to hooks to scripts to stuff you might not have even heard of yeah I definitely think it depends on if you're an educational channel or a storytelling based channel they're gonna be two different types of hooks but hold on hold on I hear you ask why should I listen to Humphrey well just like many of you not too long ago he started out on his YouTube journey with a dream and zero views but from those humble beginnings, Humphrey has spent countless hours of trial and error crafting out an awesome strategy which you can now follow. Oh, and you know all of that advice about packaging your videos that hasn't been working? There's a reason for that. But I would say for a new YouTuber, yeah, default to simplicity because Oh, Humphrey, you tease. Let's jump in. On your first video, you just press record. You were looking at the screen, like not the lens. You didn't edit a single bit of it. Your first line was the most generic one on YouTube, which is, What's up, guys? My name's Humphrey Yang. Tell us how you went from that to where you are today. The origin is I just wanted to make videos that I could send to my friends answering personal finance questions because I usually would be the person that people would talk to about those questions. It sounds simple, doesn't it? You're the go-to person in your friends and family group for this thing or that thing. But what if you were the go-to person for this thing or that thing on YouTube? Many channels have been built on that superpower. So complete this sentence. I want to make videos so that I can. That is one of the simplest ways to start providing value to a target audience. I made three videos in July 2019. They went nowhere. I think I got 10 views on each of them at most and they were all just my friends. But at the end of 2019, I was watching personally a lot of TikTok myself and I found myself addicted to the app and I remember I searched hashtag personal finance on TikTok. TikTok and it didn't exist. I was first to market, even on a new platform, even though we didn't know what the future of TikTok would look like in 2019. I was like, at least it's different than YouTube. And so I started making content on there. It blew up within the first like 30 days. I had 100,000 followers or something like that. And then I just started kind of slowly moving people from TikTok to YouTube. And then I started making YouTube content throughout 2020. Yeah, in researching for this interview, I watched some of Humphrey's early videos on YouTube and whew, they were bad. But so were yours and so were mine. We all go through this, right? Uh, probably was like a hundred videos in until I realized, right. oh, these videos suck. I dribble on the intro for a long time. I talk about my microphone being like too loud or not loud enough. And just like a lot of things you learn along the way when you're doing YouTube. And I think, yeah, 50 to hundred videos later, you realize, oh, look how far I've come from the first video. Humphrey is echoing one of my beliefs that you may have heard before. Nothing beats experience. So it's no good thinking about starting a channel or thinking about the videos you want to make. Don't just listen to me. Don't just listen to Humphrey, get your hands dirty, so to speak. And for Humphrey, the first step in getting creative is finding a good idea. Now, you've probably heard this before, right? But Humphrey has a really interesting scientific approach to this. And you've probably not heard of it before. At least I haven't. The thing that I think got me a lot better with ideas this year was that I really tried to narrow down what my audience persona was. Like, what does the audience care about? I'll use my example because that's what I can talk about. The video I made was called the number one wealth killer that nobody talks about. And it was about cars and cars are sometimes status symbols, right? All of a sudden you're looking at this video, the number one wealth killer that nobody talks about, it took off. And for me, I'm thinking, okay, is it about car affordability, which is the number one thing? Or is it about like, let's not be a status symbol person. So what does the audience resonate with? They don't like status symbols because a car can be a status symbol or do they just want to care about how they're doing in terms of car affordability? That's two hypotheses that you can now test in your future video. In the next video, I might make a video about top five status symbols that nobody should buy. You know, watches, yachts, whatever it might be, you know, nice cashmere clothing, designer clothing, whatever. And then another test is I can be like, okay, how much of a house can I afford? Something a little bit different, but all about affordability. You know what Humphrey is describing here? A flow chart, testing audiences with different ideas and following the paths to which the audience say, yes. This is a fantastic way to develop your niche and become your superpower on YouTube. We'll dig deeper into how to understand your audience so that they watch for longer a little later on. But for now, let's move on to the next important step in the process, packaging. For Humphrey, it all comes down to one human emotion that he's tapping into. Patty Galloway talks about this a lot. On YouTube, you need to create the intrigue. 
and then you need to get them to watch. People forget about creating the intrigue a lot, which is intriguing title, intriguing thumbnail. Obviously, title and thumbnails are always so paramount, and you know we, we're drilled with that all the time. Yeah. But it's tough because that's like the last part you want to probably be doing. You're a video creator, but now all of a sudden you're a marketer too. This year specifically, I've really tried to hone in on let's do the title first and then maybe have an idea for the thumbnail and then proceed. Sometimes I'll use AI to help me generate titles. I just ask ChatGPT, hey, do you think this title is engaging? <laughs> can you come up with 10 other titles for me so I can kind of like get some ideas? How do you get the balance right between the messaging and also the complexity of the thumbnails? I think if you want to err on the side of safety and err on the side of somebody will click on it, it should be simple, right? Three element rule, maybe it's like you plus a thing and some text. That's three mm -hmm. elements typically. Yeah. As long as the thumbnail complements the title in some way or visually represents what's going on in the title, I think it can be as complicated as it might need to be. I don't care about simplicity. I care about intrigue. But I would say for a new YouTuber, yeah, default to simplicity because like that's going to get you that intrigue and more likely to be the safe play when it comes to a thumbnail. But I'm not saying that a complicated thumbnail can't work. He's right, you know, there are certain niches on YouTube that break all the rules. Shopping haul, beauty, lifestyle thumbnails look absolutely chaotic to me. But so what? I'm not the target audience, am I? And it goes back to that workflow concept, doesn't it? You can test different thumbnails with your audience until they say yes. And YouTube's new test and compare feature is only going to make that easier to do. But after titles and thumbnails, let's move on to step three of a process, scripting. First of all, I'll write an outline down. My process is then I'll just free flow and write. I'll try to write as much as I can about the sections I know about. I try to keep some engaging points in the beginning. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to stack the video in the beginning with a lot of engaging, interesting data, perhaps, or facts about yeah. the topic that we're talking about. It's more of a hook, extended hook, I'd like to call it. If you can get the viewer to like five or six minutes in the video, they're probably going to stay for for the rest of the video. At that yeah, point, yeah. they're kind of pot committed, I like to call it. Did he just say pot committed? In poker, if if you put so many chips into the pot, sometimes you're so committed that the math works out that you might as well just go all in. But let's say for the video purpose here, if you're pot committed, you're probably going to watch it. Fun fact, actually, I played a lot of poker in a previous life and I learned two tricks. This is one of them. This is the other one. And I lost a lot of money learning how to do it. But there is proof in every video on YouTube of this pot committed logic. The longer a viewer gets into a video, the more likely they are to stick around until the end, which obviously means it's very important to start your videos strongly. I try to get people to the five or six minute mark. And then if the editing is a little bit more sparse or like I kind of like improv a little bit towards the end, I think that's fine. But in the beginning, I want it to be super cut, concise, clear so that people are really bought into the video. And surely by now, if you've been watching vidIQ for any length of time, you know where all of this starts, right? The hook. Yeah, I definitely think it depends on if you're an educational channel or a storytelling based channel. There are going to be two different types of hooks. Like in a story based video, you probably want to establish the stakes really quickly. But in an educational video, it's more about establishing like what's your experience? What kind of credibility do you have with this certain type of topic? What is the viewer going to take away from this video if they watch this video throughout the end? That makes a big difference with retention early on, which could make yeah. a big difference and if it gets served to a wider audience early on. We'll get back to storytelling, but Humphrey mentioned something there that caught my attention. You used a, a term there which excites me, and that is the, the curiosity loop. Those who've maybe not come across that term before, what is it? It's basically in psychology, humans love closing loops. If you tease to them somewhere in the video, like, hey, we're going to talk about what this interest rate means for the US economy later on in this video, mm -hmm. all of a sudden they're like, well, what does it mean for the US economy? And they, they kind of keep watching until they kind of close that curiosity gap. You can open up many of those throughout your video. And in fact, if you watch some of the video essays that are popular out there on YouTube, they're doing this constantly throughout the video. Almost like every couple of minutes, you get another loop. And speaking of curiosity loops, I need to close one that I opened earlier, which was storytelling. But Humphrey calls it something slightly different. I have some videos that I call data journalism. So I'd take a topic like why $100,000 salary isn't that much anymore. Versus the how-to videos, I, I, I kind of feel like people just want the value as quick quickly as possible and I can kind of keep them a little bit less story based. I haven't found it too much in my niche where stories are taking over like in order to okay. separate yourselves. I think it's just like quality of information and conciseness of information is really helpful. Clearly for Humphrey and many utility based channels, there is a fine balance here between storytelling 
and the value and the quality of the information itself. So how do you build a loyal audience that comes back and watches for you rather than just the information that you provide? I don't think we did a lot of storytelling for the past three years. And I don't think I did a lot of sharing about myself. And so we kind of kept the videos very information based because I was afraid of retention falling off. But I've noticed as I share more about myself, people seem to be more gravitating towards those types of videos. Yeah. Like the 10 product video that you probably watched about my water bottle. That's a video I probably wouldn't have made early on in the channel but I had a little bit more confidence to do that these days because I feel like people consider my opinion a little bit more on the social media space now. I yeah. think after you get a certain number of subscribers, but I still probably wouldn't recommend the 10 products video to a newer YouTuber just because people don't know you yet. Let's do search-based videos. Let's try to get foundation of videos so that people can continue to return to your channel and then start to work in the personality. If I were to give myself advice from three years ago, I'd probably work in the personality a little bit earlier than obviously four years into my journey. So while you might not be a natural born storyteller, don't be afraid to reveal little personality traits of yourself. Yeah. Some of your shorts have tens of millions, millions. You've obviously brought that experience over from TikTok and proven that a channel can blend long form and short form content. Is it like any sort of general advice here to, to replicate just the phenomenal numbers you've got here? Shorts are a completely different beast. They also account for a lot of my subscribers. I think maybe 40% of my subscribers are from shorts. We've noticed the conversion rate between a short to a long form viewer is not great. However, I think it builds your brand so much that I think if someone is likely to see you on the homepage later, they recognize your face and they're probably more likely to click on you in the future. So I think overall for brand building, shorts is still amazing. And it's a great supercharger for subscribers if you can get a viral short to go off. I try to get above a 70% view versus swipe away ratio. And I try to keep the videos a little bit longer for shorts around 50 seconds to 59 seconds, because I know if you get 70% BVSA and you can hold people through most of the 50 second short, it should pop off in two to four weeks. VV VSA, views v swipe away. Got it. Have you tried YouTube's new tool that allows you to directly link a short yes. to another video? Any success with that? If the video is very aligned with the long form video, yes, you will see success there. I've seen some channels that get 10% of their views on their long form video from the short itself or even yeah. more. Let's say it's a real estate tour of a million dollar mansion and it's a short and then all of a sudden the long form goes into the longer detail of that mansion. You'll probably see a pretty high conversion rate. It also should be teased in the short like, hey, make sure to check out the long video here. Do you yeah. have to include a call to action? Because, you know, time is of, is of the know. essence in a short and it feels like such an unnatural thing to do to just even say yeah. for two seconds, check out the link at the bottom of the screen. If you do it at the end, it's like, hey, I made a longer video. Check it out here. Fast. Two seconds. Yeah. It should work. There was the one thing that you were going to suggest to short form creators. What might that be? Use the word you. <laughs> <laughs> you you is it's been proven to kind of like hook more people in than like if you said i did xyz yeah. you should know about this right it's a little bit better of a hook let's say i made a short and it took 100 percent of my time i would probably spend 20 to 40 percent of the time on the first two lines so we're okay. really focusing most of my time on thinking about what hook is going to really hook people in and then maybe add one curiosity loop in the third line right like you know not for the reasons yeah. you might think dot 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 mm. and then go with the video so foreshadowing uh, yeah foreshadowing. Yeah, That's what I learned from Jenny Hoyce uh, in yeah, the interview she good. recently did. Speaking of Jenny Hoyos, on average, her YouTube shorts earn 10 million views each. And she's somewhat known as the viral queen. And if you want to learn more about her success, then watch the interview over here. And thank you for pot committing yourself to this video. Uh, you know what that means now, don't you?